So the contents of uh, my first lecture is about computer networks. So we will deal into the basics of each and how our enterprise network connects to the internet and up to the cloud. So all of you, I think, are familiar. Maybe most of you are engineers or participating in this course. I'm not sure if there are still students also participating. And computer network, networking is about computer devices or nodes that uses a set of a communication protocol and they are inter interconnected digitally for the purpose of sharing resources that are provided by the network node. The nodes are our computer, our computer, personal computers, servers, networking, hardware, and other specialized general purpose hosts. The interconnection between nodes can be uh, telecommunication network technologies, which are physically wired, can be optical and even wireless. Nowadays, we use Wi-Fi, right? And sometimes Bluetooth. And of course, the computer network will, will not be able to communicate with each other without the protocol that we use. In our case, nowadays, it's always TCP IP as the standard. So this is how a normal network diagram looks like, right? So as you can see in this course, if you will be able to attend or enroll to our Rakuten Learning Hub course, you will, you will have to undergo the basic introduction about the network or computer network diagram. As you can see, we will discuss how a PC is connected using a NIC card and how it's connected by a wired connection going to your switch. And then via fiber optic cable, it's connected to your router, your firewall, and your switch, and your servers are all interconnected. And of course, other LAN. But most of them will be connected in a typical architecture like this. So I will not deal into each and, if, each and every devices that we will discuss in the course. I just provided you an overview, right? And normally after you undergo all of those devices that are connected to the network, you will have to understand what TCP IP is. And what we normally do is we have this IPv4 uh, lecture in order to understand how we're going to provide those addresses. And normally there is a link for the learning video that we need to understand. In this session of CCNA series, I'll discuss about IP address classes. There are around 4.3 billion IPv4 addresses. Managing all those addresses without any scheme are next to impossible. Let's understand it with a simple example. If you have to find a word from a language dictionary, how long will you take? Usually you will take less than five minutes to find out that word. You are able to do this because words in the dictionary are organized in alphabetic order. If you have to find out the same word from the dictionary which does not use any sequence or order to organize the words, how long will you take this time? It may take up to one week to find out what that specific word from all the words. If an unorganized dictionary which roughly contains 1 billion words can take a 5 minutes task in a one week task, then suppose how nearly 4.3 billion addresses will make a search task complicated if they are unorganized. For easier management and assignment, IP addresses are organized in numeric order and divided in following five classes. Class A, Class B, Class C, Class D, and Class E. Each class has a range of valid IP addresses. 
the value of the first octet determines the class. For example, 0 to 127 determine the class A IP address range. 128 to 191 determines the class B IP address range. 192 to 223 determines the class C IP address range. 224 to 239 determines the class D IP address range. And the last 240 to 255 determines the class E address range. IP addresses from the first three classes A, B and C can be used for the host addresses. The other two classes are used for other purposes. Class D for multicast and class E for experimental purposes. Let's see how the classes were created. As you know, an IP address is the combination of network and host ID. In each IP address, few bits are reserved for network address. The classes were created based on the network size. In class A, the first 8 bits are reserved respectively for network addresses which gives you the subnet mask of slash 8 or 255.0.0.0. In class B, the first 16 bits are reserved respectively for network addresses which gives you the subnet mask of slash 16 or 255.255.0.0. In class C, the first 24 bits are reserved respectively for network addresses which gives you the subnet mask of slash 24 or 255.255.255.0. For example, for, sm for, for the small number of networks with a large number of hosts, the class A was created. The class C was created for numerous network with small number of hosts. Let's use an example to find the class of three different IP addresses. 1.2.3.4 191.200.100.1 192.168.1.1 To find the class of an IP address, simply pay attention on the first octet. Let's start with 1.2.3.4 if, if the value of the first octet is in the range of 1 to 127, you can say it's a class A IP address. If the first value of the first octet is in the range of 128 to 191, it's a class B IP address. If the value of the first octet is in the range of 192 to 223, it's a class C IP address. That's it for this session. Thank you for watching. Please do like, share, and subscribe. Thank you. The whole components that are inside our network, right? So if you will be taking our course, we, you will have to understand each and every component of what's connected in the network. As I have said, we need to have a shared peripheral de device. And nowadays we, all use, we also use voice over internet protocol. So normally our hard phones, which are located in your offices are also digital and have IP addresses. And the first thing that you need to understand are these basic devices, the NIC card, the repeater, the hub, the switch, the bridge, the router, and the gateway. So basically, this is the building blocks of how you connect your network. And then, of course, your firewall in order to protect your network from intrusion. So this is how a network interface card looks like. Normally, it's connected. This is an old uh, picture that's normally connected to your desktop. And once it is configured in your desktop, you'll be able to have a MAC address, and then you'll just have to connect it physically using a UTP cable. So besides from physical connection, using a wired connection, we also have wireless networks, right? And that's what we are very familiar with with our phones. We use Bluetooth and sometimes our desktop and laptops are also using this device to connect it to our headsets. 
So this is a short range wireless technology, standard use for exchanging data between fixed and mobile devices over short distance. And this normally operates in the UH UHF range. For Wi-Fi, this stands for wireless fidelity. So this is the one that you see in your offices if you have what we call wireless access points. These are the ones in the ceiling of your offices that you normally see. And this is where you connect, right? And once you have the host name of your Wi-Fi devices, normally you have a profile and password and you'll be able to connect wirelessly to your network. But actually this AP devices are also connect, connected physically to your switches in your offices. So this is again based on the IEEE 802.11 family of standards. And as I've said, in order to have a Wi-Fi connection, you need to have access points. Nowadays, there are other configurations that are coming out so that everybody will be covered. We normally have this in our offices now. We call it high-density Wi-Fi. So when you say high-density Wi-Fi, wherever you walk the floor, you will not get disconnected because there are so many access points that are available throughout your building. So if you walk from one side even to the farthest corner of your office, if you have an HD Wi-Fi configuration, you will not get disconnected. So the important thing is once we're connected to our network, is we need to have access to the internet, right? And these are the building blocks or the simplest definition of internet is that it is a network of com computers, right? But this time, in not just in your local area network, but there is a host of other computers where you can connect. For example, you can connect to the cloud, you can connect to, to the VPN, you can access uh, servers that are published in the internet, and everybody gets connected once we are in the internet. So a page on, on the internet, whether it's full, full of words, images, or both, doesn't come to you in one shipment. It is translated into digital information, chopped into 1,500 byte pieces called packets, and sent to you like a puzzle that needs to be reassembled. In other words, it's, there's an encryption, and normally it's secure. So how does... Informa information travel through the internet. When you connect to a website through an ISP and start exchanging information between computers and servers, uh, normally the exchange will be using the best possible path at a particular time. And that is what we call routing, right? Special computers called router routers determines these paths avoiding slow links and, favor, and favoring fast ones. And now we will also deal with cloud computing because um, most of the virtualized functions now that was discussed previously, those are physical servers that are loca located in the data centers of telco providers, right? In Open RAN, what, we're, what we are uh, promoting is the use of an open system. And most of this uh, virtualized service will now be hosted either in the private cloud or maybe in the future, the public cloud. But for now, mostly, most of them are in the private cloud. That's why we, we also have a network architecture in 5G called CRAN. So as you, as you know, uh, the real advantage of the cloud environment is scalability, it's interoperability, availability, because, for example, Google has, what, 3,000 data centers worldwide, and once you're connected to their cloud, there's really slim chance that you will have uh, a downtime of their servers because they can always point you to other servers that are working 
when one of their servers are not functioning properly. You can also have performance optimization and portability. So during the pandemic, uh, I think most infrastructure developers use the cloud because it's very difficult to have your hardware delivered during the pandemic. And the only way is really to subscribe to the cloud. So as I've said earlier, in order to communicate to the network, the global network, internet, and the cloud, we will have to use the IP address. And this is how an IP address looks like, an IPv4 address. And this is what was shown in the video previously. Okay, so this is the basic course that I'm talking about in Rakuten Learning Hub. So once you are enrolled in this uh, course, uh, normally you will have a number of modules that you need to complete, right? And then once you complete those modules, you will have to undergo short quizzes. We, what we, uh, this is what we call the assessment. And there will be graded quizzes. Some of them are long quizzes. And then there will be projects and simulation, I think, that are designed by my co-creator, Liberius. So once you pass all of those assessments, then I think you will be given a badge or given a certification that you have completed the course. So that's basically an overview of our course, the SDN, OpenFlow, and NFB uh, course. But before I end my course, I will also want to show you another video. Welcome back, Naj Kazi here. In today's video, I'm gonna talk about Cisco SD-WAN. You will get to learn a lot about how the Cisco SD-WAN solution operates. We'll do a deep dive into the architecture and the different elements of the SD-WAN fabric and how the different elements operate and come together to create this beautiful Cisco SD-WAN. It's the Viptela solution. It's not the Meraki. Just want to clarify that. You'll enjoy. And if you want to learn about the fundamentals of SD-WAN or SDN, I will provide the links down in the description below. Are you ready? It's going to be an exciting one. I am super pumped. Let's roll. Let's jump right into it. Here's the overview of the different topics I plan on covering today. Number one, Cisco SD-WAN architecture. Two, key design elements. Three, planning a migration. And finally, I'll wrap it up with a quick overview of the Cisco SD-WAN appliance portfolio. So let's quickly look at the Cisco SD-WAN architecture. At the heart of it, we got the underlay. And all the blue boxes that you're seeing on the screen are the routers, which we now call SD-WAN appliances. We used to call them routers, now we call them SD-WAN appliances because they're much more than your traditional routers because of the capabilities they offer. And then we have different transport we could have MPLS circuits coming in, internet circuits, 4G, 5G, LTE, and all that. Combined together, they make up the data plane. And these routers or these SD-WAN appliances could, could be physical or virtual. Uh, through the magic of ZTP or zero-touch provisioning, they can automatically come up. And we'll talk about ZTP in a bit and they could be on premise or in the cloud so they could be physically located at our branch locations and data centers they could also be located in the cloud or you can have a combination of of the two uh, to the right of the screen i want to draw your attention to the multi-cloud on-ramp it's basically a performance measurement capability that's taken into account to find the best path to the different SaaS and IaaS providers. So SaaS being Salesforce.com and O365 and IaaS being AWS and Azure and GCP. 
And the idea is that there are constant HTTP pings and DNS requests sent to each of those providers to see over which path, assuming we had multiple paths to those providers, which path is performing the best, and then making sure that we use that path as primary. The second element, security. So security with the SD-WAN appliances could either be local or cloud-based. Uh, because these SD-WAN appliances that Cisco offers have pretty robust security capabilities. They can act as a firewall for you as a single box solution. And we'll discuss more details in a bit. Uh, but you could do that either on the boxes or you could redirect traffic through service chaining to the cloud for the traffic to be inspected. The last element here is the application QoE or quality of experience. This is the secret sauce that comes with the Viptela solutions. So Cisco acquired a company called Viptela a couple of years ago. They were SD-WAN specialists, and that's what gave Cisco the ability to have a very robust SD-WAN capability. And this quality of experience score is a combination of packet loss and latency. And it's measured for different apps over multiple paths. And once again, the idea is to identify which path is performing the best, has the least latency and the least packet loss. So we can use that as the primary. The next element in our SD-WAN architecture is the control plane. So remember guys, the whole idea of the software defined networking in general is to separate the data plane from the control plane. Why do we want to do that? Well, the reason we do that is because it gets easier for us to deploy things. We don't have to touch each and every device hop by hop. We can do that centrally. That's why we want to take the control plane out and put it on a controller, which in this case are vSmart controllers that Cisco offers. These vSmart controllers communicate directly with the edge appliances at the bottom of the screen. And these vSmart controllers are able to push the routing configuration down, security configuration down, uh, and they scale horizontally, uh, which is basically a scale out model, which means um, as you continue to add more appliances to your locations, and as you continue to expand your business, you can spin up additional vSmart controllers to be able to handle the additional load. Because each vSmart controller can only handle so many SD-WAN appliances and X number of tunnels. The third element here is the management plane. And with the management plane, what you get is a single pane of glass where you can configure the entire environment, monitor, troubleshoot. What it is, is it's a portal. The customer can use the browser of their choice, Chrome or Safari. You log in and uh, you get a nice GUI. And through that GUI, you start to configure devices. And there's like a one-time setup that you have to do the very first time you log into vManage, but then after that, you have to configure templates and things of that nature, but that's where everything happens. And then the role-based access control is also set up there if you want to give access, different types of access to different people within the organization. Some people read only, others read write. vManage also supports third-party automation. So if you have Chef, Puppet, Ansible, you can use those automation tools to feed the scripts into the vManage so the vManage can then talk to the vSmart controllers to push the configs down to the devices at the bottom of the screen. So it's really, really interesting and cool. And then to the right of the screen, you see vAnalytics. That's another type of controller that allows customers to have uh, deep analytics about the environment. vAnalytics uses ML or machine learning and is capable of analyzing the entire environment for bandwidth forecasting reasons and also keeping your service provider honest because it tells you the uptime, the downtime. You can use those reports and talk to your service provider. vAnalytics also gives you some insight into how the applications are performing. The next element I wanna draw your attention to is the different type of controllers that the Cisco SD-WAN has. So there are three controllers all together. Like I alluded to a little bit ago, vManage is the portal that you log into. And this is where everything happens, right? This is where you configure everything. vSmart 
you don't touch, but vSmart talks to vManage and vBond also talks to vManage. vSmart is used to actually manage all the routers and it uses OMP or overlay management protocol that allows it to communicate with all the different SD-WAN appliances. And, um, and this is how vSmart is able to configure, you know, all the routing and security and the different type of policies that you have set up. And vBond is the controller that's used to authenticate and authorize the devices so they can connect to the SD-WAN fabric. The very first time device comes up, it must talk to the vBond controller. Um, and unless it's authorized, it gets rejected. And we'll get into some of those details momentarily, but these are the three different controllers that are part of the overall um, controller architecture. There are two deployment mechanisms. Mechanism number one, less desired, is the on-prem controller model, where the customer takes these three controllers as VMs, and you can use the hypervisor of your choice, VMware, Microsoft, KVM, whatever have you. You can go ahead and run these as VMs. Not recommended though, because you have to worry about the infrastructure that it's running on, and then the VMs and the right amount of memory and all that. And then you also have to worry about redundancy as well. Creates more complexity in your environment. What's recommended is cloud delivered model, where Cisco deploys the controllers for you. And all you do is log in to the vManage portal and then configure your SD-WAN fabric. It's that simple. 99% of the customers go with the cloud delivered model. And just so you know, most of the uh, SD-WAN vendors on a global scale uh, offer cloud delivered solutions. Some do not have an on-premise capability. Something to keep in mind. Now let's look at the zero touch provisioning or ZTP explained in four steps. Step number one, when VEdge comes online for the very first time, okay, you unboxed it, you plugged it in, it first goes and speaks with VBond over DTLS tunnel, okay? VBond, VBond is a whitelist model. And what it does is it looks at the serial number and the digital certificate that's, it, it's, it's already programmed with, and it matches the device's serial and the digital certificate to make sure everything matches. And if the private key matches on the digital certificate side of the house and the serial number matches, then it gets authorized and the vBond then redirects that vEdge to the vManage and vSmart. However, if the serial number or the digital certificate do not match, then the device gets rejected. So that's an important step, okay? So security is very key in this whole design. Step number two, after being authenticated by vBond, once starts communicating with vManage, it establishes a DTLS or TLS tunnel with vManage. And just so you know, the difference between DTLS and TLS, DTLS is for UDP traffic and TLS is for TCP. And assuming that we have already set up our templates on vManage, the entire configuration for that vEdge gets pushed down by the vManage controller like magic and all of its interfaces come online, it gets configured, gets all the IP addresses, all the routing information, security, everything. Step number three, what ends up happening here is that the vEdge starts talking to the vSmart and vSmart, once again, there's a DTLS slash TLS tunnel established and what ends up happening is vSmart establishes an OMP session and that's the overlay management protocol. That's a secret sauce routing protocol. Think of it as BGP on steroids because BGP does not carry security information, whereas OMP has the ability to carry security information along with routing information. So it's a lot more capable than BGP. And the final step, step number four, is where the two V edges start talking to each other over IPsec tunnel. Now notice the difference here. We're no longer doing DTLS or TLS tunnel. Now we're doing an IP, IPsec tunnel. And another important element to keep in mind is there's a BFD session or bi-directional forwarding detection session established between the V edges. And the reason for that is for a quick failover to happen. As soon as a path goes down, 
B of D immediately switches the path over in a sub-second. Now let's look at the Cisco SD-WAN key design elements. First off, let's look at overlay VPNs and topologies. So in this diagram here, we have V-Edge to the left and we have V-Edge to the right. In the middle, we have transport. And it doesn't matter whether we have MPLS, Internet, 4G, whatever, because remember the whole idea of SD-WAN is the um, we're no longer dependent on the tr underlay transport. We could care less about the underlay. It's all about the overlay. Well, how are the overlays formed? Well, you see the A, B, C. These are the three different VPNs that are created. And VPNs are essentially VRFs or VRFs. These are virtual routing and forwarding tables. They're completely separate. These VPNs don't talk to each other by default. You can make them talk to each other, but by default, they don't talk to each other. So if you have some compliance requirements in your network like PCI and others, you can create a separate VPN to handle that traffic and create that separation and be compliant. And what's exciting here, guys, is each VPN can have its own topology. So here, for example, VPN A, which is red, could have a full mesh. The green VPN B could be a hub and spoke. And the yellow VPN C could be partial mesh or point to point. So it gives you a ton of flexibility to pick a topology that best matches your business needs. Now, from a traffic engineering perspective, we have a couple of different options. Option number one, which is the default option, that's active active load sharing. Now, one thing to keep in mind, it's per session based, not per packet. So once a session is formed, either over MPLS or internet, for the life of that session, that session will always take the same path. But then when the next session is required, a different path is taken. So this is how the load sharing is accomplished. The next element here is weighted. So for example, if you have a 10 meg MPLS circuit versus a 100 meg internet circuit, you would wanna send, for every 10 packets you send on the internet, you would wanna send one packet on MPLS that can be configured using per session weighted model. The next one is application pinning. Here, if you have real-time traffic like voice and video, you can always pin it to MPLS, regardless of how great internet is performing. Because you're paying a ton of money on MPLS, you may go, you know what? For my real-time traffic, I will always use MPLS, no matter what. And when MPLS goes away, then I would use internet as a backup. That can be done. The last one up is application aware routing and that's my favorite one, it's SLA compliant. SLA stands for service level agreement. What that means is under vManage, we configure a policy for our voice where we say we cannot go below a certain threshold and we define that threshold, latency, jitter, loss, we define all those parameters. And then if those parameters are violated or the SLA is violated, I should say, we switch the traffic over to the other link. Um, so this is pretty neat, and I think be because we have what's called DPI or deep packet inspection capability, we have the luxury of using SLA compliance. Now from a high availability and redundancy perspective, depending on how your site is set up, if it's layer 2, we can do VRP. If it's layer 3, we can use OSPF or BGP on the LAN side of the house. Uh, for transport, we can fail over any of the paths, not an issue. From a head-end redundancy perspective, we can have redundant appliances at the data center and you can have a single appliance at the branch with multiple circuits coming in and we can fail over either over a circuit or we can also tolerate a hardware failure. And from a controller perspective, of course, we would want to have multiple controllers running in our environment so we're able to fail over if any of the vSmart controllers were to fail. From a security standpoint, Cisco has, I believe, compared to some of the other SD-WAN vendors, a pretty big advantage. They have the full capability of running an enterprise firewall, uh, an IPS, uh, URL filtering, advanced malware protection, secure internet get gateway, or SIG, and SSL proxy, all on a single box. You don't need another box. So I call that a one box solution. So if you're trying to save money and consolidate hardware footprint and you don't want to maintain yet another piece of hardware at all of your locations, you can get rid of your existing firewalls and consolidate that security functionality onto the Cisco SD-WAN appliances, but 
A quick word of caution though, if you do that, make sure you do a lot of engineering homework and you look at the throughput and the performance numbers and you pick the right type of boxes. Because what ends up happening is when you start enabling advanced security features, CPU starts to take a big hit. And at that point, your box is not gonna perform at the marketing threshold that you see on Cisco's website, right? You really have to know how the SD-WAN appliance behaves when all the different bells and whistles are turned on and most likely would have to go one level up or in some cases two levels up to make sure that you have the right type of hardware appliances to be able to handle the overall load. Another very important element that is very near and dear to my heart is planning the migration from your traditional WAN over to the SD-WAN. That's a big step. So how does that work? L let's look at some of the elements that we should consider before we migrate. First, we need to look at controllers. As a customer, we need to decide what type of deployment mo model we want to have. 99% of the customers go with cloud hosted, but if you have some strong regulations and you must have them hosted on-prem, you do have that choice, but you have to make that call ahead of time. Also, we have to decide what kind of redundancy we would want. Also, we have to look at the scale of the controllers, right? We have to look at how many sites we have and how many tunnels are going to be created and then figure out how many controllers we would need and then make sure we have redundancy on top of it. And from a controller high availability standpoint or redundancy standpoint, we need to make sure that not only the vSmart, but the vBond and the vManage, all of those controllers are actually highly available and redundant. And finally, firewall ports. So we need to enable certain ports on our firewall to allow the controllers to talk to each other and also allow the controllers to speak to the SD-WAN appliances. There's a lot of communication that is happening back and forth uh, with all these different network elements within the SD-WAN fabric. I will provide link in the video description, so check that out um, to the firewall ports and some of the other configur configuration elements that you should consider. Next element is the data center. So we have to look at, do we have any new circuits in the design or are we dealing with existing circuits? You have to look at the overall design. Are we talking full mesh, hub and spoke? You have to look at routing. We have to look at traffic engineering. We have to look at the different policy requirements, quality of service, different SLAs that we have to consider. All that needs to be taken into consideration. Same thing with the branch side. We have to see, are we dealing with existing underlay or are we gonna have new circuits coming in as part of the redesign or the re-architecture or the upgrade? Also, we have to look at the different applications and application flow. We also have to look at the design, full mesh, hub and spoke and all that. We also have to look at the policy. Are we gonna do local internet breakout at each branch or do we wanna backhaul the traffic to the data center? A lot of the customers these days are taking advantage of the local internet breakout, but that, that, that does mean that you have to really consider your security policy because you may have a central security policy model today, you may have to look at a distributed security model. And we also have to consider access to SaaS and IaaS applications and, and see whether or not we can benefit from that optimization. And licensing, smart account, virtual account, make sure it's all tied together because the entire SD-WAN fabric is kind of tied into the smart and virtual account. So it's very important that you have a grasp on that and also the CPE ownership. In other words, who is going to be the owner of record when it comes to the SD-WAN appliances? Are you as a customer in charge or have you hired a third party to manage your environment? If you have a managed services provider who manages your environment, then we have to take into consideration how the devices are gonna be managed and if you're actually going to hire professional services or advanced services to configure your SD-WAN, we have to look at how that ownership is gonna play into the overall scheme of things. And here's how the migration sequence looks like. The first thing we wanna do is we wanna set up all the controllers first. Then we wanna turn up our data centers. And finally, we start bringing the branch locations into the SD-WAN fabric. From a high level, kind of a super high level SD-WAN transition strategy perspective at the branch locations, what we wanna do first 
is that if we have two sites, site A at the bottom and site B at the top, we would want to replace the internet routers with the SD-WAN appliances first and set up our secure tunnel. Then what we do is we already have a tunnel established over the internet. We set up an extended tunnel over MPLS. So this way we have redundant tunnels. In case the internet goes down, we can continue to operate over MPLS. And then finally, this is the ultimate Nirvana stage where we are completely migrated over to SD-WAN, both MPLS and internet. And that's the ideal place you would want to be. But for most of the customers, it takes a while to get to that stage, depending on how many sites you have. And the final thing I want to talk about today is the SD-WAN appliance portfolio. So for branch and aggregation, we have the traditional Cisco routers, the ISRs and the ASRs. The ISR 1000 is a small box. You can get it in different form factors, like a desktop or maybe like a 1U type box, depending on your needs. And it's able to terminate a different type of DSL circuits, 4G, LTE, uh, things of that nature suited for small to medium businesses. ISR 4Ks, on the other hand, are suited for medium to large enterprises and branch locations primarily. And they're capable of handling voice modules and UCSE modules as well. And there's also a power supply redundancy. Uh, so you, you start getting some hardware level redundancy at the ISR level. And ASRs are the big boys these are primarily targeted toward data center, HQ locations, and locations that have very high bandwidth needs. Now the box below is Viptela OS. ISR 1K is the only box that is capable of running the Viptela OS. The acquisition of Viptela allowed Cisco to inherit these VEDGE boxes you're looking at on your screen. So these came from Viptela. Cisco didn't get rid of them, they're still here. You have a choice to either pick between the VEDGE boxes or the ISR boxes. It's your choice. The difference being ISRs have the ability to run security, whereas VEDGEs do not have the ability to run uh, security capabilities. So if you're looking to deploy security, then you need to look at the ISR boxes. Virtualization. So there are two very interesting boxes. The ENCS or the Enterprise Network Compute System 5000 and CSP Cloud Services Platform 5000. These two boxes are actually x86 type boxes that have the ability to run virtual network functions. So you can spin up multiple virtual routers and virtual firewalls and virtual WAS for optimization and things of that nature. And you can host third party VNFs and it allows you to have a lot of flexibility. It's primarily targeted toward edge computing model where you have really large stores or branch locations where you need sort of like a data center type virtualization model. But instead of going to the cloud, you have high speed, low latency needs at the access level. So these boxes get you that. And finally, we have the cloud. And this is where the uh, AWS Azure GCP comes into play. If you're using the traditional ISR routers or ASR routers, then, then you would want to get the CSR 1000V or CSR 1K to be spun up in one of these clouds. But if you're using the Viptela OS and the VEDGE boxes, then you would want to get the VEDGE cloud box to be spun up for you in one of these infrastructure as a service providers cloud. And that wraps up today's video.